I'm tired of having to learn things from losses, but this is the point we're at with the 2022 season. We're going to talk about everything we learned from the loss against the Auburn Tigers on this episode of the Locked On Aggies podcast. You are Locked On Aggies, your daily podcast on the Texas A&M Aggies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Locked On Aggies podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Joey Ikes. Thanks so much for making Locked On Aggies your first listen. I'm joined today by my good buddy, Cameron Honesty, from aggieswire.usatoday.com. And today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. Cameron, as I mentioned in the open, I'm pretty sick and tired of learning things from losses. But unfortunately, we're getting pretty good at taking these takeaways from these losses. And as you mentioned in your five things we learned from Texas A&M's loss to Auburn article that is posted and available for you to read at aggieswire.usatoday.com. The very first thing you mentioned as the Aggies dropped to three and seven and one and six in the SEC, just an unthinkable outcome for the season. Injuries and attrition have really buried any chance of victory for the Aggies during this six game. I can't believe I'm saying that six game <laughs> I losing know. streak. Yeah, it's it's bad. And, and uh, you know, I was listening to uh, to Billy Leachy of uh, the Luchander podcast. I kind of caught it the other day. And him and David Nuno are doing the same thing we do, you know, every, pretty much every week, just just kind of going over the the just the terrible losses and why it's happening and what we think and i think he he had a great kind of kind of point there he said well if you're blaming the entire you know season on injuries and attrition and that's why they're losing then you know you're probably in this wrong career and and i want to i just want to preface that's not what i'm saying but what i am saying is that when they start to catch up and you're already playing poorly and you're already playing a type of football that is just ugly and undisciplined and just erratic. And, and just it, it looks like they just don't show up or even know what they're doing half the time. Then I, I just love to throw that out because we, for example, is Antonio Johnson, who was back uh, against Auburn. And there were moments in that game where if he wasn't playing defense, yeah, they wouldn't have only allowed 13 points. He was showing up in the backfield almost every play. He was getting TFLs. He was, you know, he was blocking passes. He was doing everything he's supposed to do because he's just that kind of player. And yes, he's very talented and he's going to be a high end draft pick most likely next season uh, or next draft cycle. Um, we'll see about that. But but at the same time, that's one guy, you know, and I can name a Damani Richardson or. Uh, you know, a Tyreek Chappelle, other guys defensively, and I'm really naming defense because, you know, the O-line is pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty much the other um, area of this team that's just completely banged up with by season any injuries to three starters. And but but, you know, and I'm not going to be that guy I say, well, no excuse. You know, you should be playing better. But I'll say it here. You should be playing better. You can't just blame it on the fact that Bryce Foster's out, that Aki uh, Gaboji is out, that Jordan uh, Spasomechik, I can't ever do his name right, Moko is out. You got You have depth pieces. We, we heard it all offseason about, um, you know, just the depth of the O-line and how if one guy got hurt, you know, someone else is going to step out. Matthew Wyckoff was the first one that always came out of Jimbo's mouth, and he's been terrible. He's been horrible, and I'm sorry to say that, but it, it is it, – there was a hit on Connor Wiegman in the game, and it was a it was a whiff by our left tackle, who is young and still inexperienced. And you know, it's you, we see it all the time in football. They they whiff, they know they whiffed, and they kind of just stand there and watch their quarterback get destroyed. And I, Joey, I was you know, I had a lot of stuff going on that day, and and I wanted to throw the controller at the TV when I was seeing. I was like, what the hell, man? This is just this is disturbing, and this is. 
this is not what I want to see at all. I, and this is not what we should be seeing by now because a Connor Wiegman just came back, right? He just came back from, <laughs> from missing the Florida game because of the flu, which again, catching the flu is not his fault. And, you know, he's just trying to play he, the guy played, the kid played his butt off in that game and he wasn't getting much help. And obviously Moose Muhammad not being out, that's another story entirely. And he wasn't playing and that didn't help him. So I'm not even going to mention Connor Wigman's play because the kid, the kid worked his butt off and he did everything he could to try to win. But every, every aspect from the trenches on both sides to just the defense as a whole, how they've regressed, it's been horrible. And yes, but to the point injuries, especially to some of the important pieces of this team have hindered this team to the point where it's almost like they give up and they're just like, you know what? He's out. So I'll play 50%, you know, I'll do all I can type of thing, which is like a middle schooler, right? Who gets a, a little boo-boo in practice and then goes, oh, I don't want to do this. I'm just going to play as hard as I can. And, you know, this is big boy football and we're not seeing big boy football out there. And it's, it's ugly as hell, man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely not pretty. And I think it's one of those things that, and you, you talk specifically in your, in your article about injuries and attrition. And I think the, the third factor is is youth right and so a lot of times like a lot of times what happens is you get these college teams and their starters may be their younger players a lot of times because um the the really high quality veteran players leave for the draft right Mm -hmm. like after a redshirt sophomore season or a junior season they'll leave for the draft and so but so you wind up with depth pieces that are sort of your more veteran pieces that are, you know, experienced, have been in the program for a long time. A&M is dealing with just massive amounts of youth everywhere. And when you add that on to the youth, the injuries, the suspensions, I mean, we're going to spend a couple of minutes here talking about, I I haven't spent very much time this week talking about what happened with Moose Muhammad on Saturday. (laughs) And I, you know, I tweeted probably seven times during the game, hashtag where's Moose, because you could just, you could just feel how much that offense needed that additional mm-hmm. weapon on the field, especially in a game that we haven't mentioned yet, that Devon A-Chain didn't play in because of a foot injury. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we talked about his performance in the second half against Florida, and we didn't really get until a little bit later on the information that there was a foot injury in the second half against Florida. Yep. And that was a pretty big reason for the reduction in usage and the reduction in production. Um, but now you're without Devon H. And you're already without Anaya Smith for the season. You're playing down two or three starters and you suspend one of your, or you bench. I don't know if suspend is the right word. You suspend <laughs> one of the two really high quality receivers that you have um, because he's wearing the wrong kind of arm sleeves. And as a, as a policy that the head coach has, when there are certain weather conditions, skill players are not allowed to wear arm sleeves because the moisture condition can cause ball security issues. And so it's, it's a thing apparently. And there are lots of folks. Yeah. When I heard that, I was like, okay, that sounds like a little dumb to me. And it's yeah. like, okay, but it's apparently a thing. And it's a thing that lots of college programs have in place. And, it was apparently the the way it was explained in the couple of places that I've heard. It was sort of one of those like, "Hey, Moose, when you're ready to play, take the sleeves off and you can play." And he sort of chose not to play. And that's a <laughs> that's a it's a really rough look, you know, for really the yeah. whole program. That you know, one of your really important premier players that knows he's an important player on the team at this point mm-hmm. um, chose not to play over some sleeves and that the coach chose not to play him over the sleeves. And so it's one of those, like at this point, if you give on something like that as the head coach, do you give up too much in terms of what you're trying to build from a culture standpoint and the standard? Maybe. And I think that's probably reasonable. Um, Speaking of building a culture, building a team, building those sorts of things. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. 
you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's so easy to go to LinkedIn Jobs, add your job, create your job post for free, add the job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you could quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's really important to finish the year strong. We got about six weeks left in 2022. We're running into 2023. Make 23 the best year for your business ever. And you could do that by making your next hire from LinkedIn Jobs. It's why the small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Cameron, as we get back to the the things that we learned from the Auburn game, mm. it's it's something I've broached on this show before. I've broached it at Aggie's Wire. Um I even went a little further than this on Aggie's Wire this week. Um <laughs> And, and, and your post yeah. is, it's time to hand over the play calling duties once and for all. Yep. Address that to Jimbo. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we weren't on the exact same page, I would say, because um, there's some realistic value to it. Um, there's another kind of, uh, you know, aspect of it that, you know, it's it's out of, you haven't shown us anything this year. You have underperformed to a point where, you almost just deserve to lose your job. And that's that's one thing. The other thing is the whole recruiting aspect, the money, everything's tied into that. And so I kind of took the easier route of saying, look, I mean, the <laughs> the thing that I believe AM is gonna do is retain him and basically give him an ultimatum as if you want to continue coaching here for the future, you need to go hire one of the Select guys, you did an excellent list at Aggies Wire about some of the top potential offensive coordinator candidates that are out there right now. Um, I mean, there are plenty of options that are doing very well. And if you are a person who loves statistics, just go into the top scoring offenses. Just kind of look it up. I think every database has it. Tennessee, Georgia. Ohio State, all these top programs, all these top schools that are in like, you know, the top 10, top five right now have excellent coordinators. Yes, the head coaches have something to do with it, but a lot of these guys just know what to call offenses, progressive offense, new offenses that work in 2022 and beyond. And look, there's a lot of ego uh, attached to it. Jimbo Fisher is a guy who, A, is making a lot of freaking money right now. And the thing is that what a lot of people don't get is that those who make as much money as him and look at the example of billionaires and guys like Elon Musk, even who have giant egos and think they can take over businesses and, you know, do whatever they want with them. And they know everything. And that's not what I'm saying. Jimbo Fisher is, but he is acting like that right now. He's kind of acting like, well, we may be three and seven, but my system works. And it's like, he needs to be banged over the head and said, dude, you have won three games. You're playing a UMass team this weekend who has one win. You only have two more wins than them, and you're favored by what, 33 <laughs> points, which yeah. I thought was hilarious. I'm just thinking, wait, did they A&M win eight games this season? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, they've scored Seven 30 weeks. points once yeah. <laughs> this season. It blew my mind today when I was doing another article. But anyways, to not get off point, they there are too many options right, there, right now, especially after the season of guys who they're going to get some head of coaching opportunities. But at the same time, we, you and I both know that A&M – is a fantastic opportunity for an up and coming play caller and somebody who wants to move right after an a and job to a head coaching job. They pay very well here. We know why Mike Elko stayed as long as he did. He had opportunities coming at him. He chose the Duke job, obviously, because he deserved it. He did an excellent job here, and he's doing a fantastic job at Duke right now. I think he turned him around. I think they've won about six or seven games this season. And so, look, they, this job is, is something that is going to be sought after by a lot of people. He just needs to get out of the way and let the other people make some decisions. I know he doesn't want to do that. 
I get it. I, you know, they gave him the keys and they said, you've got the keys, you do whatever you want. And he was doing a pretty good job for a while, but this is drastic. I mean, this is, this is panic time. I mean, this is bad. And I, we, you and I have both had to remind ourselves, granted, we cover all AM sports here, but football takes over everything. And every week, we have to remind ourselves that this team is three and seven and one and six in the SEC, and they are very, very bad. And they, they just lost to an Auburn team who is not worse, apparently, because they beat AM, but they were also very, very bad. And you couldn't beat the very, very bad team. So when you start getting into that, kind of echelon of you can't even beat the bad teams things need to change and big things need to change and that's i mean that's the first thing realistically that i believe will change i don't know i say that with a question mark we'll have to see so. yeah it's one of those things where you don't become the head coach of a college football program like this like texas a&m like florida state before it you don't win a national championship without a healthy dose of self-belief and yeah. And believing a lot of times that almost every room you step in, you're the smartest guy in the room, sure. right? Like that's just, yeah. it, it's just part of the personality traits of someone who elevates themselves to that level in their career. And, yeah. and so, yes, he believes in what he's doing offensively. Um, but at a certain point, like you just got to understand that w- one of the things about these college football programs at this point is and we got to move on, but is that they've become so big, right? It's a, it's, I would argue that being a a college head coach is more difficult and more work than being an NFL head coach. Oh yeah. Just in that, like, Hey, you, there is zero off season for Mm -hmm. a college head coach. If, If you're not in season coaching, you're recruiting, both in season and out of season, there's always recruits in and out of town. You're always hosting people. Um, it's just a massive job. And especially when you're like, when you're Jimbo Fisher, right. Of Texas A&M, you are, you're the CEO, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and we've seen Nick Saban cycle through coordinator after coordinator after coordinator mm-hmm. on both sides of the ball. And it doesn't matter because he's the CEO that's overseeing everything and things change and shift with the offenses and the defenses as guys come in. But, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter because it's his program, right? And he doesn't have to be the guy who calls the offensive plays or the defensive plays because he's the guy that oversees the program. And we see the same thing at several of these other schools. Now with some of these guys, it works for them to be the offensive play caller and the head coach. Um, But like, when you con- I in my article this week at Aggies Wire, which happened to be, you know, it's time for Jimbo to go. Mm. I, I included an image in there that I found that was um, very telling to me, <laughs> and it's one of those things that I always notice every time I, I'm watching an A and M game. You can tell when an offensive play caller or when a head coach has things together and under control and is in like a flow state or, or moving things the way that they're supposed to, because everything looks organized. Everything is clean. Everything is well put together. They don't have 45 sheets of paper and a spiral (laughs) notebook and all this other stuff that they're dealing with while they're trying to call plays. Like Mm -hmm. to the extent that like Mike Leach holds a post-it note in his hand. (laughs) I was about to and, say that. <laughs> and, I, and I know for a fact yeah. that, like, I've heard him talk about that before. Yeah. That Post-it note does not have plays listed on it. Yeah. That Post-it note is to keep track of how many touches the guys on his offense have gotten throughout yeah. the game. Like, that's <laughs> how much – that's how well, A, he understands his offense. Yes. That's how well adapted he is to it. And that's how – um at, and, and we're talking about Mike Leach here. Like we're not talking yeah. about like the most buttoned up individual here, <laughs> but like yeah. the, you see Jimbo with his, with his glasses down real low. Right. Cause he can't mm-hmm. see the play sheet anymore without him. And that's Edge. always a signal to me. Like if you're wearing the glasses on the sideline to call plays, yeah. it's time Yo. to stop calling the plays. <laughs> um, it's, and like it happened to Jason Garrett when he was the offensive yeah. coordinator with the with the uh, Giants, right? He never yeah. wore the glasses when he was the head coach because he stopped calling plays. Yeah. Then once he started calling plays when he moved from the Cowboys to the Giants, 
those glasses come on and now it, and it just it yep. was what you expect it to be when your yeah. offense coordinator is wearing the glasses at the tip of the nose. <laughs> yeah. And so he's got the glasses at the tip of the nose. He's got mm-hmm. three different laminated sheets, at least three. <laughs> Plus, he's got a full spiral notebook open with the pages just flapping everywhere and a pen slid down in the spiral <laughs> like he's my my third grader going back and forth to school, <laughs> right? And like, and it's how can you possibly have clarity about what you're calling on offense? How can you possibly have any sort of synergy about what you're doing? Or how can you build any sort of tempo or rhythm calling an offense when you're dealing with that much stuff? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, even like Sean McVay, head coach of the Rams, they're not having the greatest season, they're dealing with a lot. Yeah. But like when you see Sean McVay on the sideline and he's the head coach of an NFL team and he's calling the plays, Kyle Shanahan's the same way. Mm-hmm. One piece of laminated paper. Yes, it's a it's a wide sheet that's folded into basically two. <laughs> one piece of paper in their hand, one, you know, legal size, big legal size piece of paper in their hand. And they're calling an NFL offense, which anytime you hear anything coming out of college to, to the pros is how much more complicated, complex, how much more verbiage, how much mm-hmm. more there is in an NFL offense than a college offense. And yep. they manage to get everything they need to get on yep. one play. They get all the situational stuff on one sheet. They get all the play calls on one sheet, all of the go for two information on one sheet, all of that stuff on that one sheet. And Jimbo's got 45 of them. And I just, you cannot yep. convince me that on top of, like, we see it every game, right? A play happens, there's a call that he doesn't agree with, with the official. And he's hollering at the official, and the play clock gets to 15 seconds, and he doesn't have the right personnel in the game. He doesn't have the right play call in. Now he's calling a timeout with eight oh. minutes left in the third quarter because he couldn't get a play call in in time. And we just see it happen so many times Mm -hmm. that if that combined with all of the discipline situations and the ups and the downs that have happened and suspending players because of sleeves and all this kind of stuff, like maybe this guy (laughs) doesn't have his hands around this thing like he's supposed to. And maybe the answer, at least for 2023 is, okay, we're going to take the play calling away. Essentially, we're going to go to him and say, you're going to hire a play caller and we're going to save ourselves, you know, eight or nine million dollars in this buyout by paying it out this year instead of next year uh, or instead of all at once. Um, And if that allows him to get his hands back around it from the CEO standpoint, fantastic. If not, then it's time to move on because he clearly can't hold on to this type of program, this level of program in this um, this era of college football anymore. And that's really unfortunate because. It really seemed like, for, especially like from a recruiting standpoint and a, all that kind of stuff, that he sort of had it going in the right direction. And it's just all falling apart on the field this year. And we've seen it play out in a whole bunch of different areas. Cameron, before we get to we got to get through three points in the next segment. But before oh we God. get through those, I've got to talk to you guys about Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for sports betting information, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From football to basketball to soccer and esports, we've got it all at betonline. And if you love sports podcasts like this one, you can find sports podcasts at Bet Online as well, where they're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fixed. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. And now that you've made Locked On Aggies your first listen, make sure you go check out Locked On Sports today for all of your sports needs, all the sports, everything going on over there, the take of the day, the game of the week, all that kind of stuff going on at Locked On Sports today, wherever you get your podcast. Cameron, we're going to get through these quick. I had to go through my Jimbo rant there. But <laughs> we're going to talk about three promising – we're, we're going to tie all of these into one and, and sort of a what do we what did we take away that showed us some promise for the future? The first one, I think, is Connor Wigman. Like you mentioned earlier, he struggled a little bit, didn't have a whole lot going on around him that could help him, only threw for 121 yards, didn't complete 50% of his passes, uh, only threw one touchdown, which came late in the game. But even in all of these circumstances, 
there were some plays and there were some moments that, you know, were wow moments from the quarterback position that we haven't seen from anybody else playing quarterback this year at a and um, Combine that with, you know, we mentioned Devon A. Chain being out of the game. Um, we saw Amari Daniels get way more run than he normally is getting because mm-hmm. he hasn't gotten hardly any because Devon A. Chain's yeah. gotten almost all of it. Um, had a 38-yard run towards the end of the game, had 84 total yards rushing on the game. Um, that's pretty. That's a great sign in terms of what the future of the running back position looks like for AM. And then we mentioned this guy several times on the podcast because it's just amazing to me that LT Overton is 18 years old. He's supposed to be playing his senior season oh, yeah. of high school football. Right? He's supposed to be playing the, in the playoffs in high school football right now. <laughs> and he just started his first game at Texas A&M and the SEC on the road against Auburn. He had nine tackles and a tackle for loss on the night and was second behind Antonio Johnson in tackles. Talk about those three guys and what their performance against Auburn tells us maybe about – maybe there is some hope for this program still in the future and that one lost season may not be, you know, the, the death sentence for the program that we worried it might be. Yeah, and I mean all those guys you mentioned, obviously those are the kind of the key players that – I'm looking forward to next season. I don't worry, you know, a lot of the fan base right now, and granted, let's be honest, the people who do not get paid to cover this team and put put a lot of the work in who are just kind of putting emotions out, and that's fine. We all do it. Talking about the transfer portal all the time. You know, are these guys leaving? Who's leaving? Who's staying? You know, don't worry about that now. What I would tell people right now is when you watch these last two games, yes, from a bowl perspective, it's meaningless. This team is not going to a bowl game. They the biggest thing they have left for them is to maybe spoil LSU, who was just ranked six tonight um, in the college football playoff rankings. You know, we'll see what they're ranked by then. That's look, play spoiler. You know, don't let them beat you on your home field. That's how you have to look at it. And I'm telling you, the UMass game this weekend, I'm going to be looking for every guy you just mentioned, especially LT Overton, who I think is going to be one of the best players to come out of AM defensively. Kind of like a DeMarvin Leal was. I think he could even be better than DeMarvin Leal in that way, especially from a pass rush perspective. But uh, Amari Daniels, that was someone who jumped out at me because I didn't see, you know, I didn't I didn't really see uh, anything that was like super jump off the page, but I saw great footwork. I saw a, kind of a second gear uh, when he had about that 30, 38 yard run or something. I think it was at the end of in the fourth quarter. He's got, I mean, he's got good vision downfield. He's a he's a weapon. He's somebody who, if he kind of matures in this offense, he's not going to be Devin on chain because nobody is going to be Devin on chain. But I think a combination of him, Le'Veon Moss, is one guy I hope gets uh a little more run in this game. I, he only had about five carries. I think he I, I don't know what was going on there, but I think they just gave more of the workload to Marty Daniels. Just I don't know, maybe just more experience. I hope both those guys play a lot this weekend and obviously in LSU. Um, and then, yeah, Connor Wiegman is pretty easy to talk about because we mentioned at the top of the show, by the way, there's a reason why I did not mention Devin O'Chain being out because even mentioning Devin O'Chain being out is something that we could harp on for a while. Um, but even him being out of that game was not an excuse they could use because of the guys we're talking about right now. I think they could have won that game with Amari, with, with Amari and with Le'Veon Moss, it, I think if they played a little more together in a 50-50 split, but everything else was what brought that team down. So this is what we have to look for now. We have to look at these young guys, how they mature, how what they bring to this offense and defense for the future. If you're looking at 2023, don't just look at the, the darn transfer portal. Remember, there are going to be a lot of guys that are staying and want to build with this program. I've heard the grapevines through – Tex Ags and a lot of guys I trust a lot that, you know, things are going better than we think. And especially in the locker room, there's a lot of guys who are buying in. They're practicing hard every week, no matter the losses. These guys love playing together. One guy I can tell you is Evan Stewart is one that we don't really have to talk about a lot. This is somebody who is going to, I believe, stay with this program. He wants to play with someone like Connor Wiegman. The combination of him and Moose I wrote about it this week is something that could end up being one of the better wide receiving tandems with quarterback uh, in the FBS next season. We'll have to see how that works out. But all these young guys are still playing their butts off. I can tell there are 
moments where, yeah, you know, the deep run defense, for example, has been horrible, and we can talk about it all day. A lot of that is discipline. A lot of that is a youth factor. These guys just don't know how to play kind of gap integrity type defense and and uh, and plug those holes up, and they'll learn. They have the talent and the size. But I'm looking at all these guys. I can name all these players. A Walter Nolan, a Shamar Stewart. I, I'm looking towards these last two games of what can you bring me immediately out of the gate for 2023? What can I focus on? What can we focus on in terms of the building blocks going forward? Because we know guys are leaving. We know special players like Antonio Johnson and Demonte Richardson and Devin on chain. Hey, uh, hey, hey, hey. back in but yeah that's that's pretty much my final point is that those are the guys we have to focus on watch the team however you want to i know it's not as fun anymore because we're not playing for anything but look we're aggies true and blue we, we love this team no matter what we're going to root them on till the end of the season so but yeah those are those are three players that i kind of singled out because they are what i would call kind of foundational guys now mark daniels i wouldn't call him a true foundational guy but he could be he's got the skill set he's got the trust of the coaching staff um, so it's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun to watch for, for those guys these last two games. And hopefully my biggest hope is that Connor, you know, just balls out, has his best game against LSU to close out the season. I think that'd be fantastic and would be great for his confidence going in because we know he's the starter coming in next season. And that's that is something to be thankful with, that we know who is going to be the starting quarterback in 2023. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of those, you know. A great game from Connor Wigman against LSU completely changes the narrative mm -hmm. of this, even if they lose to LSU, right? A really good, really competitive game where they put some points up on LSU, play a little bit more sound run defense, and are able to, like I said, be competitive. Maybe they lose, maybe they win, but be competitive against LSU and show some really high-quality play on the offensive side of the ball – between a couple of the guys that you've got on that, that with youth on that side of the ball and, you know, don't let Harold Perkins blow the game up on you. And <laughs> that'd and be ironic. Yeah. And you're going to be, um, you're going to feel much better going into 2023 than you do. If you yep. go out there and get boat raced um, in your, yeah. in Kyle field against, uh, against the team that's sort of established by the sec as your, as your rival that you play on Thanksgiving yeah. week every year. I guess what we're saying here is be competitive, yeah. be competitive. I, you just do not want to see you come out and just, and, and, you know, just, just not care anymore. You know, if you're competitive at the end of that, especially against LSU, because it's a talented LSU team that's really playing towards something this season. If you show your best effort and you give them a hell of a game and they respect, they're going to respect you after that. And you should, and you should look through the rest of the season and how you performed against Alabama and, and most of the top teams you played, you were not blown out. You were in most of those games. You just mm -hmm. came up short because of all the things we've talked about all season. So, yep, they've really only been, you know, quote unquote, blown out in two games this year. Yeah, uh, one of those had a blocked field goal for a touchdown. <laughs> one of those had, a, and then an interception for a touchdown with a quarterback injury thrown in there. And then one of them had, one of them was the Florida game where you were missing twenty something players for yeah, the game. So, so uh, you're you have not really been blown out of of mm -hmm. basically any games this year. The ball has not bounced. You force a fumble that, you know, that is an obvious fumble with a clear recovery that doesn't get called a fumble. You don't <laughs> challenge the play because you're because your head coach is too busy with his forty five sheets of paper um, to challenge the play, and you wind up losing a game by three points when your defense had just forced a turnover that got overturned because somebody's <laughs> pinky was out of bounds. And then you, they force another turnover and you don't challenge it to get the ball back. And it's just, uh, it's been plays like that that have kept this team from having the opportunity to win in spite of all of these problems, all of these things that we've talked about, the talent that they do have has kept them in games. And, mm -hmm. and it's really, uh, it's really important to continue to show that throughout the course of this, these next two weeks, hopefully get a win against UMass, go in, play well against LSU. If you're able to upset LSU and throw their, their hopes for the season out in that game at Kyle Field right after Thanksgiving. That's the best possible way you could go into 2023 at this point. But just be competitive. Continue to play for one another. Continue to play for 
the school. I love the as, – as hard as I've been on Jimbo this week, I love the answer that he gave to the question about what do these guys have left to play for, mm-hmm. to play for each other, to play for Texas A&M, yep. to play for these fans and this program and, and really for, for one another uh, and for pride for the rest of the year. So, guys, thanks so much for making Locked on Aggies your first listen today. Uh, I'm your host, Joey Ikes. Thanks, Cameron, for joining me. Cameron, you can find him on Twitter, at Cameron Honesty. That's O-H-N-Y-S-T-Y. You can find me on Twitter, at Joey Ikes. You can find the show on Twitter, at Locked on Aggies, as long as Twitter still exists. You can find us on, <laughs> yeah. you can find us on YouTube, Locked on Aggies there as well. Um, and now that you've made Locked on Aggies your first listen, please make sure you go check out Locked on Sports Today and Locked on SEC. Locked on SEC host Chris Gordy takes you around the conference in 30 minutes or less with help from the local experts of Locked On. It's a great way to keep track of everything that's going on in the SEC. Even though the Aggies are out of contention, there's a whole lot of really cool stories happening in the SEC right now, um, and it's a really great place to keep up with all that. Guys, thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you tomorrow.